Good afternoon, everyone. Despite what your screen says, uh, I am Dr. Kimberly Martin. I am the Director of Multicultural Programs at Missouri State University. Um, and we are pleased to present this Martin Luther King Day uh, speaker for you. If you just give us a couple more minutes, she'll be back and we will get started. Thank you so much. And there she is, I spoke her up. <laughs> ah, great. Um, we'll go ahead and start then. Uh, I'd like to start off by welcoming everyone to this uh, Martin Luther King event. Uh, all the more poignant in uh, the times that we, we now find ourselves in. Um, and I know Jamira is going to talk about her activism and, you know, what that means today and in light of what's going on in the past couple of weeks, especially. And so I'd just like to start off with one of Dr. King's lesser known quotes, because we all know the nonviolence and all that stuff. You know, I have a dream. But one of the things he said that a lot of people don't realize is we know through painful experience that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. And we have seen that play out in our nation these last couple of weeks. So I would... Uh, uh, encourage, that's the word I'm looking for, everyone who is on this uh, call today to use today and this week to study his work, uh, some speeches that you might be interested in uh, include Drum Major Instinct is the name of one speech, uh, To the Mountaintop is another, and Beyond Vietnam are three really good ones besides the I Have a Dream speech. Also, some books I'll recommend for you is Drum Major Instinct, To the Mountaintop, and Beyond Vietnam are some of the non-conventional uh, book titles uh, that, he, uh, that was written about Dr. Martin Luther King and his work. And so before I introduce our speaker today, I'd just like to say, um, please use the question and answer feature when you have questions for Jamira. I will moderate those for you. Do not use the chat. And so without further ado, let me tell you a little bit about our honored speaker today. Jamira Burley is the head of youth engagement and skills at Global Business Coalition for Education. She has worked at the intersection of policy, community and social good. And she provides unique insight that will actually help change, actualize, excuse me, the change we all desperately need. Coming from a family where both of her parents and 12 of her 13 brothers have been incarcerated. Jamira's advocacy is very personal. As the first of 16 children to graduate from high school and pursue higher education, Jamira is a Temple University graduate. Having worked six years at the School District of Philadelphia as a youth development coordinator, Jamira was recruited by Philadelphia Mayor Michael Nutter to lead the City of Philadelphia Youth Commission. She represents the interests of over 600,000 Philadelphia youth and has worked to ensure voices were their voices were represented at every level of decision making. Most recently, Jamira has worked as the National Deputy Millennial Vote Director at Hillary for America, developing national and state-based strategies to engage and inform millennials from a range of backgrounds and interests. Prior to Hillary for America, Jamir uh, managed the gun violence and criminal justice portfolios at Amnesty International, which is one of the large, first and largest human rights organizations in the world. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Jamira Burley. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and the cool thing about Zoom is that you can change your identity and don't mean how <laughs> That's right. I'm, so I'm excited to be here and thanks for that amazing introduction. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It is truly a pleasure to join you today in celebration of Martin Luther King's Jr. Day of Service, even as recent events of the last year has forced all of us both um, to take our work and our service virtually. So I would have loved to meet you all in person, but, you know, we're um, probably not best right now. Um, but over the last um, 15 years of my career, I've often been asked to speak in front of a wide range of audiences, from policymakers to business leaders and heads of states. 
But I'd be, I'm going to be very honest. I am the most humbled and honored is when I'm in the presence of young people. Um, reasons being is because you, really, our generation doesn't accept anything but an honest interaction. And because you also don't have a problem calling out the bullshit, right? Um, regardless of the consequences. Um, two qualities I believe um, that one, I appreciate as an individual, but also two qualities I believe that our world desperately needs right now. They, we need more um, honest interactions. We need folks who are willing to call out things when they see it. Um, because I think it's very indicative of the life and legacy that Dr. King le led, which is to once you see something, you have to say something and you have to do something. Um, so before I get started, I would like to first thank the organizers for inviting me to participate in today's event. Um, but more importantly, you know, for cultivating the space for you all today. Um, because I think as we all are working from home, experiencing school from home, trying to navigate this new reality for however long it's going to be, um, the fact that you have institutions like you all that are um, creating space for us to have more nuanced conversations around what's happening in the world today. Secondly, I would also like to thank each and every one of you. You know, you all have answered the call of leadership in some way, either at home, in school, or in your community. And I think it should not go unrecognized, especially at a time when the very rights we all hold dear is being held hostage um, or being threatened by those who um, want to continue to seek to marginalize and make those who are mo the most vulnerable within our country suffer. Um, and I, I think it's really important that we focus on those who are the most marginalized because oftentimes those folks find themselves pushed to the very margins of our society with little or no access to resources or recourse, which I believe we all saw over the last few months um, due to COVID-19. The fact that COVID-19 didn't create um, new inequalities, it expanded the ones that had already existed within our community, everything from homelessness to violence to healthcare inequalities, um, which is why today I think um, and every day moving forward is a reminder of each and every one of us, our deep responsibility to protect and fight for those who are the most marginalized, regardless of where those people call home. Um, it's a duty that I take very seriously because I've seen firsthand how the world can crush those who lack agency, those who are the most oppressed because of the color of their skin, because of their gender, their sexual orientation, their religion, or simply because they had the misfortune of being born into the wrong zip code. You see, our society has placed so many barriers after barriers to uphold a very white supremacist agenda um, that puts the risk of everyone on this call, everyone in your university and your communities at risk. It's really an agenda that has become evident more um, over the last few months, um, really the last few years. An agenda that would have you thinking that Black Lives Matter um, means anti everyone else an agenda that tells you in order for us to end gun violence, we must continue to arm more people, even though the data says otherwise. Um, it is an agenda that um, will have you thinking that if we continue to arrest our way out of our problems, we will somehow reduce crime, even though um, there's no indication that that is true. Um, it's also an agenda that tries to hijack the bodies of men, women for the pleasure and the egos of men. Um, but more importantly, it is an agenda that will separate families at the border under a falsehood of national security. Now, I'm sure I don't have to tell you all, you are an intelligent group of folks. I don't have to tell you that we are entering very dangerous times. Um, some would say no more dangerous than the last few decades or even since the time of the civil rights movement, especially for specific communities like the communities that I come from. Um, which I think is in direct conflict to the progress that we've made since Dr. King was assassinated just a few decades ago. Um, and it's a reflection of the deadly sacrifices that he made, recognizing that he could be killed um, for wanting to protect and fight for those who, who live at the border and at the margins of our society. Um, which is why I ask you today, right, um, to really think about how can you use your voice your privilege, your access to be able to ensure that other communities don't have to continue to suffer. And so as I talk with you today, I know now that I've never been more the skin I live in than ever before. You see, my whole life I have borne witness to the systematic ways in which our society limits the financial and physical outward mobility of people who look like me. 
people who look like you. I mean, just a few weeks, or maybe it was a few days ago, but just a few days ago, we saw how white terrorists tried to overtake the United States Capitol. They were treated very different than the protesters who stood outside and asked police officers to stop killing us. And I can say that as someone who was on the front lines in cities like New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Baton Rouge with gas masks, um, that we were standing asking folks to stop supporting the state sanctioned murders of black bodies. Um, and I can tell you that despite the election of Barack Obama in 2008 and the upcoming confirmation of Vice President elect Kamala Harris, there is still so much work to be done. And there's still so much required of all of us, which is why the world needs you today, tomorrow, and moving forward. And that's not to put undue pressure on any one person, because this is about a collective effort our collective responsibility to cultivate and create the world we deserve. Um, and I say that because if we're truly going to get folks to the promised land that Dr. King talked about, everyone has to be at the table. You know, Dr. King talked about the promised land and he um, talked about it through a really an unchained imagination to envision a world in which he himself would never actually attain. And I think that's one of the things that is missing about this moment. When we talk about defund the police, when we talk about dismantle white supremacy, when we talk about reevaluating the impact of education within our communities, it's really about reimagining, reimagining something very different than the institutions we've all been forced to operate within. Um, and I think for black folks, particularly at a time when Dr. King envisioned this promised land, we could barely drink out of the same water fountains as our white counterparts. And yet he envisioned a world in which his children would grow up and not be judged for the color of their skin. So yes, imagination is so much needed in a time where we're trying to reevaluate how our society operates and, and whether or not we're comfortable with the status quo. And I say that without, to be honest, without knowing or frankly caring about the political affiliations of anyone in this space, because regardless of who you voted for, Know that at this very moment, we are in the fight for the very conscious of America, really the very conscious of our entire world, um, for the very lives of people who are not heterosexual white men, people who have been jailed down, beat down, shot down. And we have the nerve in this country to call that justice. But what really is justice, world and the law does not see you as equal, let alone as human. What is justice when the place you call home will question your citizenship? What is justice when the potential for a, predator, um, for a predator's success is more important than the rights of women and girls? What is justice in a world in which the American dream is really only, attain, only attainable and accessible by the chosen few, by the affluent, and by the super educated? Now, it wasn't too long ago that I was sitting exactly where you are today. Maybe not the exact seats, but I was sitting in the classroom setting as well. Um, and as a student, I was trying to figure out who was I, try to figure out what kind of impact did I want to make? How did I want to show up in the world? And more importantly, what did I want to do with what I knew to be true? You see, I had arrived at college by sheer determination, but also because I was lucky. Um, as a native of Philadelphia, <clears throat> the best city in the world, um, it is also a city that is known as the city of brotherly love and sisterly affection but in reality is a city written with gun violence and a broken education system that continues to hold communities back. And it continues to perpetuate communities to live in a sense of hopelessness that they wear like a winter coat. You see, people from my community often face limited options. So if you can't shoot a ball or throw one, um, you might find yourself in either a body bag or a prison cell. So getting to college and getting to where all of you are at this moment was an accomplishment, especially because no one in my family had ever done it. Um, and I'm sure many of you can relate to that. Many of you are probably the first in your family. You're probably the one who in many cases made it out. And you're probably at this moment dealing with the idea of survivor guilt, dealing with the pressure of living up to the expectations of your family and friends. Um, and because you can relate to that, remember that you matter, your values, your ideas, the things that you learn during your college experience will really help to cultivate and define the impact that you make on the world. 
I also think it's important to recognize that all of you are trying to be more than your predecessors, to outlive the things in which people have tried to define you by, by your gender, your race, your religion, your zip code. Um, and as someone who recently um, have been greeted by my 32nd birthday, um, I say that very cautiously because my little sister always says I'm ancient now, but you know, age, age is important. Um, I say that because 15 years ago, when I started this journey of social justice, when I started on this pathway of really fighting for those at the margins, um, I was a 15 year old girl confused. I was filled with so much anger. I felt like I had the weight of the entire world on my shoulders because I wanted something that was so out of reach. I had envisioned a world for myself that was so unable to people who lived on my block. Um, but it was, a, it was a reminder, really a milestone because people who, and for my communities oftentimes don't make it out. They oftentimes don't make it to 32. And so I carry that responsibility with me oftentimes to bring the stories of those who I know um, who never enter the spaces and places that I've gotten the opportunity to. I grew up in a world in which um, very much folks would say I am the product of the war on drugs. Growing up during the crack epidemic illuminated for me an already fractured imbalance within our government, within our society of who has the money, who has the power. Um, and it also is one that can, continues to perpetuate itself today. You see, I was raised in the West Philadelphia area, um, known mostly for producing the likes of Will Smith. That is my claim to fame, I like to tell folks. Um, but more importantly, known for um, the best cheesesteaks and water ices you will ever have. So if you ever get a chance to go to Philadelphia, please do so. Um, but I was born to a teenage mother who had her first child at the age of 15. And by the time I was old enough, um, I was surrounded by 15 siblings in a household that had long since forgotten the sound of my father's footsteps. Um, for he had found um, home in an eight by eight cell, unknowingly set it into motion, my older brother's following in his path and continuing the generational cycle of trauma. You see, as a child growing up in this environment, um, those incidents occurred over and over again to my family, to the people in my community, even to how I saw the depictions of minorities on TV. And it really aided in my view of how I thought people were treated versus what they deserved. For years, I watched as my family members and people in my community get swallowed up into our criminal justice system. If you grew up in environments like mine, you start to question and you start to assume that the conditions of your community is normal. Normal to see people get shot, normal to see loved ones go away to prison, normal to see folks drop out of college and drop out of school, um, or even get pushed out of their educational institutions. And it's normal to see people really questioning whether or not they have to keep the lights on or feed their families. But normal doesn't make it right, right? It doesn't make it just, it doesn't make it humane. Um, and watching this, learning this, I knew then that my family, my community, they deserved better. There's a really great quote by James Baldwin who said, to be a Negro in this country is to be, and to be relatively conscious is to be at rage all the time. Um, I would actually expand on that and just to say that to be conscious, to be a person, a caring person, to be aware is to be at rage. Because once you are truly awakening, awakened to what's happening around you, you can no longer turn on the blinders. You can't unsee the greed, the oppression, the neglect, the criminalization, the misogyny. Once you see, you really start to question everything around you. You start to question your own responsibility within that. Um, I tell folks all the time that it's, it's really a, a lazy analysis for people to jump to the conclusions that the circumstances and the barriers that communities across this country and around the world are facing is by happenstance without truly understanding and considering the structural ways in which our government creates the conditions for this to happen. Um, Thomas More once said, well, he said in the, his book, A Utopia, that if you suffer your people to be ill-educated and their manners to be corrupt since their infancy, and then punish them for the crimes for which their first rate education disposed them. What is to be expected is that you first make thieves and then punish them. Is that not what we have done? Have we not built entire ecosystems that thrives off the pro and profits off the pain and suffering of those who have been stripped of power, resources, and basic human rights? Have we not created an education system that at this very moment is filtering thousands of children into the school to prison pipeline 
or to school de deportation. A school system that is at this very moment educating students for jobs that won't even exist by the time they enter into the workforce. Systems that are setting large populations of our communities to fail. And the list really goes on and on and on. These issues aren't issues because one person dislikes you or agree. These problems exist because they are ingrained to the, to the very foundation of this country, of our world, built on an idea that there should only be a small portion of us that is deserving of rights and deserving of access to resources and opportunities. But you know, despite all of the overwhelmingness of the problems that we're facing and the problems that we will continue to face if we don't do something about it, um, people are fighting back from the activists who are reimagining what justice looks like for communities facing constant state sanctioned violence to the mayors and sanctuary cities upholding their protection for immigrant families as those communities continue to be um, attacked by our government um, to the indigenous communities who continues to remind, of, uh, remind us of our duty to the protection and the preservation of our air, water and land um, to the frontline workers who every single day are risking their lives to ensure that we don't unnecessarily lose anyone to a pandemic, to the pandemic that shall not be named, um, or to the activists who are pushing back against um, gun violence prevention to only include um, regulation on um, privately owned bought guns, but really to include what happens in marginalized communities and the intersectionality of how criminal justice has played a role in cultivating violence in those spaces. You see locally, nationally, and internationally, the resistance is growing, but it will require each and every one of us who claim wokeness, right? Who claim to care to stand up and do something about it. You see for more than a decade, I've regional institutions of power to shift the balance of power and create pathways for those who are closest to the problem to be closest to the solution. Um, it is my belief that the easiest thing we can all do is to feel sorry for someone to take a moment and walk in their shoes for a privileged opportunity to say that we've experienced what they have and then going back to our lives. But as a result of recent, in the recent events in the historical context of human rights violations in this country and around the world, that is no longer enough. It's no longer enough to say you care about justice but not equal justice, right? It's not enough to say you care about um, human rights, but be unwilling to actually fight for them. It's not enough to say you value women, but seem unbothered when misogyny is staring you in the face because, because it might be coming from someone you love or you're a friend of. It's not enough to say you demand safer streets, but be unwilling to recognize and hold police officers accountable because they might be the very thing that make black and brown bodies feel unsafe. I say that because none of us are truly safe. None of us are safe when the human rights of another person is denied. None of us are safe when we cherry pick who life matters, who is deserving of the next hashtag, who is really worthy of putting our bodies on the line in the name of justice. Which is why in the months, the day, I mean, I should say in the days, really, the weeks, months, and years ahead, it's going to require all of us to stand up. It's going to require all of us to stand up and unite it and in solidarity with each other, um, sometimes with people who look like you, people who sound like you. But most of the time, they won't. They won't look like you. They won't sound like you. But that doesn't mean they're not deserving of a revolution. The issues of our society are much bigger than one person, one community, one nation. But it has the potential to destroy each and every one of us if we don't do something. For we are not just defined by the actions we take, but also the moments we stand silently complacent. Dr. King said, our lives begin and end the day we become silent about the silent about the things that matter. Not just when it's popular, when it's comfortable, but because it's the right thing to do for yourself and for someone else. And, you know, I wasn't always personally aware. I didn't always speak up. I didn't always understand my power or understood how my experience can help to influence and aid um, the lives of other people. There were many times I was scared, nervous, intimidated. Many times I felt not smart enough, unworthy to be in the spaces and the places that I was in. But despite that, I learned to not only make myself a priority, but also to create pathways to better myself to ensure that when the time came when opportunities presented itself for me to advocate on behalf of my community and communities like mine, I was ready. 
I learned to walk into spaces recognizing I was invited because I was deserving regardless of what community I came from. And I say that because from a very young age, I knew the life that I was born into wasn't the life I wanted to live. I had watched gun violence rip through the streets like hurricanes. Um, and they say bullets have no names, but I remember a few. I remember my brother Andre, who was 20 years old when he was killed in 2005. I remember my cousin Kyle, who was shot and killed in 2016, or my nephew, Quadir, who was shot and killed that, um, just two years ago. Now I share all of this with you to understand that regardless of your circumstances, you, you and they are changeable if you want them to be. You may not be able to change every single thing that happens to you, but you can change the world to ensure that it doesn't happen to anyone else. You can choose how those experiences show up in your life. You don't have to be defined by them. They can add texture to how you define your work. When I decided to stop allowing other people to write their version of me into history, I realized that I wanted more for myself and for the communities that I came from. I wanted to not just be known as some girl from West Philadelphia who fell, um, who fell victim to her circumstances, who got chewed up and spit out by the world. Instead, I wanted to be the one that they whispered about, the one who faced every challenge head on, who didn't allow herself to be silenced, who refused to remain seated in the face of injustice. Every single day, I'm fighting to remain that version of myself, the version I created despite my zip code, um, despite the circumstances of my birth, despite my mother, right? Despite my family, despite what they had experienced and how that um, laid the foundation for the community in which I grew up in. You know, who knew that that little girl from one corner of the world would be able to make the impact that I did having um, over the last 10 years working in social justice. And it continues to fuel really my own desperation to create a new reality for other young people around this country. Young people who are just as deserving as anyone else. At this very volatile moment within our history, it's important for all of us not to leave this event, not to leave any event really, without truly understanding the importance of what you've all been given and the responsibility ahead. Every one of you are in the position that you are today because someone believed that you mattered. They believe your potential was limitless. Some of them use their access, their network, their privilege to ensure that we, who was once faceless, a nameless person, could have the tools necessary to reach our full potential. So the question you must ask yourself is what are you willing to use your access, your network and privilege to also create pathways for other people to be where you are today? I say that because we are currently faced with the largest youth population the world has ever seen, 1.8 billion young people, most of whom are growing up in countries grappling with nationalism ideology. Millions of girls are still forced into child, um, into child marriage. Young people are still forced into child, uh, to become child soldiers, whether you're talking about it on the south side of Chicago or in villages in Sudan. Basic necessities like clean water, healthcare, education, or even a safe place to lay their head is becoming more and more of a foreign concept, only accessible by the rich and the affluent. The destruction of our values in our lands are happening every single day while all of us live within the, the very um, comfortable confines of our own reality, which should have all of us questioning, what will be left for future generations if we don't stand up and do something? These circumstances that, ever, that again put all of us at risk, they oftentimes put in jeopardy the sustainability of any progress we have made since the life of Martin Luther King was taken from us. So now is not the time to hide our heads in the sand, just to pray, right? We hear a lot of politicians every time something happens in this country that we're sending thoughts and prayers. We don't have time for thoughts and prayers alone. We need action because inaction allows for um, the circumstances to con continue to exist and for communities to continue to suffer and for people to continue to lose their lives. So we have to ask ourselves, what are we willing to do? And if at this moment you're thinking that you're too young, too poor, too whatever, you are wrong. Every single movement in history, young people, poor people, everyday people have been at the forefront of change, leading with their energy and their passion. People who were not I'm solely bound to party lines, right? They weren't solely bound to the roles in which 
um, politicians led their lives. And they sure enough wasn't constrained by the social constraints of our elders. This time should be no different. The question we must ask ourselves again for ourselves, for our communities, is are we willing to act? So I'm gonna stop there. And I know we have a few questions and I'm super excited to have a larger conversation around social justice, your impact and ways in which you can create change for your community and yourself. So thank you. Thank you, that was powerful. You hit on a lot of stuff. So I'm gonna open the Q&A now for any questions or comments, but I'm gonna ask the first one because I'm curious. Talk a little bit about how you got started in activism at such a young age, like what spurred you to do that and what has kept you going? That's a great question. And it's a question that I always pose to adults who say they wanna support young people, right? There's the question of, do you wanna be a bridge or a barrier? Um, and so in 2005, um, my brother Andre was shot and killed. And within a week, um, my principal and my school counsel had noticed a change in my behavior. And one day they pulled me aside and they asked me what happened. And I think out of a fit of rage, I like screamed at them that like my brother was killed and I didn't wanna be here. And I remember my principal, a black woman, Miss Young, she paused and she looked at me. Um, she didn't try to downplay what had happened, but I remember her saying, you know, you can either choose this moment to be a victim or you can do something about it. And so I felt really empowered in that moment to think about, well, what could I do? I didn't have any money. I didn't have a nice fancy title. Um, I barely wanted to be in school. And so I started thinking about, well, how could young people be violence interrupters? And so um, I co-created um, the Panther Peace Corps in my high school, where we trained high school students how to be violence interrupters and to really influence their peers to use forms of emotion, what we now know to be emotional intelligence, um, to actually talk out their problems versus reduce to the use of violence. And I had no idea it would be successful. Um, we later on, within a year, actually implemented that school, that program into the top 10 persistently high school, persistently dangerous high schools across the city of Philadelphia. And that laid the foundation for, you know, I was like, oh, I could do that. Now I feel like I could do something else. And the more I learned, the more that I realized that violence is the outward face of so many systematic problems. And it opened my eyes for the better, I think. Right. And so how did you continue that beyond high school? Like what, you know, you eventually won, you know, the Oprah Magazine Award and all like that. So how yeah. did you gain momentum and all of that to keep going? I, I guess every every time, every space that I'm in, I'm always looking for opportunities to serve. And so when I went to high school, I was I, I got hired by the school district of Philadelphia to continue to run that program in all the high schools and continue to kind of speak out on why it was important to use young people as a pathway to create change. And so through that, I actually got um, had interactions with then former mayor Michael Nutter, who was in the process of formulating um, the Philadelphia Youth Council which would actually be appointees of city council members and they would sit at the table when policies were being developed that would impact the young people across the city. And so he decided to hire me to help lead that work. And since then I've now realized that it, it's a part of my professional career. Like I want to continue to serve in a professional capacity. Um, and so through that, I think folks, you know, I like to tell people all the time that how I've been successful is because I create, people realize that I'm actually trying, I'm doing this for all the right reasons. Mm -hmm. And so they continue to want to invite me to the table. But now that I'm no longer a young person, according to my <laughs> sisters, um, I'm always thinking about who can I bring up, who can I pass off an opportunity that enables for their unique experience from their generation to be able to add texture to the conversation. So hopefully that answered your question. Yeah, it did. Um, I'm going to share with you a couple things in the chat in the question and answer. One, the first one is no question. I just wanted to say that you are an absolutely amazing speaker. Such powerful words. I got chills. So you're doing a good. You're doing some good here. Uh, we do have a couple of questions though. The first one is thank you for your vulnerability today. Uh, my question for you is how can we as young people make a difference when we are constantly being told that we are too young. To be honest, you're going to always be told that. Um, you would be surprised, even at 32, I'm now in space and the people are like, oh, you don't have enough experience, Jamara. As soon as you get more experience, you'll learn. Um, but I would say, don't listen to those people. Don't listen to their naysayers because oftentimes, to be honest, those folks are afraid that if you become too successful, you're going to take their slot. 
uh, mm. which is why you now see so many young people who are no longer asking for permission to be able to do the work they know is required. And so I would say continue to operate as if you've already gotten permission, right? You've gotten the permission from yourself to be able to speak out and speak up on behalf of things that you see in your community are, are, are wrong. And eventually folks are going to realize that they have to engage with you in order for them to be seen legitimate and to be seen like they're, they're including the, youth, the voices of young people. So never get discouraged by folks who are saying that um, because honestly, you're gonna hear it constantly by folks who are afraid of your power and afraid of what you will force them to do when they have to listen to you. That's awesome. Um, another person asked, what are some projects, some new projects you're working on if you can tell us and is there anything we can do to help? That's a really great question. Always looking for help. Um, so, I, um, so as I mentioned, as was mentioned in my introduction, I work for the Global Business Coalition for Education. And my role is to really help governments around the world um, in collaboration with business leaders to understand why they should make the investment in public education. Um, I will tell you now, I don't believe that there is any one silver bullet to ensure that we create a larger middle class or that we end poverty around the world. But what the data does tell us is that when young people at the very baseline have a comprehensive education that meets the demand of the, the workforce of their time, that you actually can ensure, um, you can actually see the numbers decrease in so many other issues um, or so many other inequalities. And so one of the issues that I'm working on is continue to raise the awareness of why we should better invest in public education. And I think that conversation is starting to happen more here in the US um, mm -hmm. because our grade K through 16 is like trash or K through 12. Um, and the second thing that I'm working on is we know that criminal justice reform is going to be a huge issue in the administration. We have more individuals currently incarcerated than we had at the height of slavery. Um, and so we need to really start thinking through how, what does safety look like? What are the roles that we want our justice system to play in our communities and whether or not the traditional institution of criminal justice reform, I mean, of the institutions of our justice system makes sense for the world in which we wanna create. Um, and so to the question of what you can do is that I would ask each and every one of you is to think about your own passion, right? If you're passionate about young people, if you're passionate about the environment, try to find organizations within your community that are looking for volunteers to, to get folks to sign up or to raise awareness or to um, fundraise for, to continue to keep those organizations going. Um, but also, you know, you can always create your own thing. You don't have to wait for anyone to create it for you, whether or not it's a student group organization. I was a part of a number of those in my college career. Um, or if it's something as simple as like a, a podcast where you're helping to inform and influence your peers about what are the issues impacting their community. It's a weird time in a way that we are all virtually at home. Don't yeah. think that there's still not creative ways in which you can still use your voice or at the very least inform your friends. And at the baseline, I would say the hardest conversations we can have is with our family members. So who, what are the conversations you're having with your mom, your dad, or with that uncle that's, you know, a little crazy. Um, what are the conversations you're ensuring to push them to think more progressively or to care about the issues that are plaguing our communities? Because what we know is that older voters do vote and we want them to hopefully vote more um, in line with our values and the things that we find important. That's great. And I just want to add to those students of Missouri State University, if they're as the director of programs, multicultural programs, if there's anything my office can do to help facilitate uh, what Ms. Burling is talking about, please don't hesitate to reach out. Here is a very good question, because I know we have all felt like this, especially uh, with 2020. Did you ever have a moment where it seemed like nothing was changing and you just wanted to quit and let the system be? Oh, for like the first 10 years of my life, I mean, 10 <laughs> years of my career. Um, when I started talking about gun violence back in 2005, it wasn't a sexy topic, right? Activism wasn't cool, where you now see activists like getting brand deals and are getting their own TV shows. Back in 2005, no one was talking about gun violence in a, in a, on a national scale, particularly when it pertains to black and brown bodies. And so right. I was very disheartened that there was never gonna be any massive change, which in part was one of the reasons why I started to look at, well, what are the root causes? Because maybe if I can't get people to talk about gun violence, I can get them to talk about poverty. I can get them to understand that education was a pathway to prevent gun violence from happening. And um, 
And so I'm excited that over the last five years, we've seen the transition of so many other communities now talking about gun violence or talking about criminal justice reform in a more holistic way that includes, right, from the children, the students at March for Our Lives who are saying, actually school violence, we can't just talk about school shootings without talking about urban, urban violence and how those two things show up differently. And so I would be very similar to the life and legacy of Martin Luther King, right? He knew that there was a possibility of something happening even outside of his lifetime. And so we should recognize that the work that we're doing isn't to say that it has to happen um, and it has to happen now in order for me to do this work. The right. question is how are we laying the bricks, the foundation, so the next person who comes behind you continue to add um, to the progress. Change doesn't happen overnight, even if we really, really want it, um, because it requires for all of us to change attitudes, systems, and policies. So again, look for, look for those opportunities to get um, small successes, but really the work is oftentimes years long or generational, generationally long. Um, but it doesn't mean that you shouldn't do something about it now, even if it may not come to fruition for years to come. Right. And uh, that yeah, brings, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that brings to mind, you know, a quote from Dr. Martin Luther King when he said, I may not get there with you. He was fully mm -hmm. aware that he may not get to the promised land or whatever with us, but he still uh, proceeded with his, you know, his, I would say mission in life to do what he did. And also I'll just do a side note for any of you who have Netflix, a really good movie that kind of illustrates this that just came out, it's called One Night in Miami. Mm -hmm. It's about, um, yes, yeah, it was good, wasn't it? And- Jim um, Brown, Muhammad right. Ali. Um, Malcolm Jim X. Brown, Muhammad Ali, Sam Cooke. Sam Cooke and Malcolm X. And in they- the same was, hotel room. Right, and it was just for the people who may not have seen it yet, it, it explores their early you know, thinkings of who they were and where they were going and that they all had different roles to play and that they may not, they understood that everything's not gonna happen at once and also that they may not be around to see it. So I just recommend that this week for anybody who has Netflix. Um, yeah, and it's a reminder to your point. Yeah, I was just gonna say, it's a reminder to your point that we all have a different role. No one is saying right. you have to, in order for you to care about social justice, you have to make it a full-time job. You could work in tech and still get them to care about social justice. You can work in environmental justice and still think about like the intersectionality of other issues. Exactly. exactly. Or you can be an artist and still like speak up. So find your lane that makes, that seems the most authentic to you because then you can show up as a whole person and not just as someone who's doing this for clout. Absolutely. Okay, we got a bunch of good questions coming in. How do you deal with people that don't want to learn or change, or at least present that way in, initially? <laughs> I mean, didn't we just see that recently? Um, yes. <laughs> okay. I would honestly say that there are two categories of that, right? There are folks who will never learn, who to be absolutely honest, we have to put policies in place because they are gonna continue to do things that are harmful to our communities or to harmful to communities we care about, regardless of the facts. We've seen that. Then there is the folks who are afraid to ask questions, who don't wanna appear stupid, right? They don't wanna to appear to be asking something that is very obvious. And so I would say is trying to like put those, those folks in, in one of the other two boxes because then you can figure out where to, to put your energy. Is the, don't put your energy at folks who are never gonna change their mind, who are gonna suck the, the inspiration out of you because mm -hmm. they are very much ingrained and believe in what they want. Versus go to the folks who are afraid to ask questions. I learned this really in 2016 when I was on the Hillary campaign because I, I got sent back to Philadelphia doing GOTV, which is basically the week before the election. So get out the vote efforts. And I was encountering so many people who, you know, didn't know because they had previous criminal records whether or not they qualified. And, and some of us would be like, oh, maybe you should have just Googled that. But you don't know what you don't know. And I think we all have to create space for people to ask the hard questions or ask this quote unquote stupid questions if it allows for us to have more comprehensive question uh, answers around how we move our people to the promised land. Um, and so yes, forget about the folks you will never change. Focus on the people who are willing based on whether or not you have the, the energy and the, um, the time to really invest in folks who wanna learn but don't know how to ask the question or to find the answers. Thank you. Um, here's another good one. How can, and this is really relevant for us as uh, university administrators, students, faculty, staff, how can colleges and universities better 
support important social issues? And could you give us a few examples? This is a really great question because, um, so on when I do on the when as a as a consultant or a strategist that I actually work with institutions like businesses and like nonprofits who say young people are a priority, but it turns out they actually don't have the infrastructure to engage them in an authentic way, right? It's easy to say, oh, we had a young youth speaker. Well, did you also hire a young person? Did you also include them in the ideation and the implementation? Um, and so there's levels to really what that looks like. And so I would say for any institution or individual who is trying to actively be a part of the process and to support students in their development is, is really question um, whether or not there is a pathway for engagement, right? Is mm -hmm. there a space and place where young people can ask those questions where they feel like they're going to be empowered and not looked at as stupid? Right? Is there a way for young people to help to structure what those, those systems look like? Outside of like traditional student government programs, are mm -hmm. there youth representations on the board? Are there youth a part of the, um, the faculty planning um, to develop the, cu the culture and implementation? And that doesn't have to just be um, people who are current students, but also folks who, who fit the age range, right? Who can give you perspective on what that looks like. Um, and so I would say, again, it has to be in, ingrained within the institution for it to be seen as an active player and trying to engage young people beyond just asking their thoughts young people have to be involved, involved in the ideation, the implementation, the evaluation, and then also the monitoring and the practicing of those, those, those institutions. So whether you're creating a youth council or whether you're hiring, I, I'm, I'm a firm believer of a phrase called um, a youth in residence, right? We have creative in residence, we have entrepreneur in residence. What does it look like to have a young person working on staff actually influencing our thoughts and process and not just on these one-off um, brainstorm sessions or focus groups? That's awesome. Like there's a lot of yeah. directions you could go. Exactly. Oh, I enjoy that, especially as <laughs> the work that I do. Um, here's another good one. How do you suggest we handle situations with those in our own homes, family and friends, who may be stubborn and refuse to listen to those proactive conversations? And then yeah. they add, I am afraid to make my voice heard by others when I cannot even say what needs to be said in my own home. That's a hard question. Um, and I would actually go back to what I said earlier about those two categories of people, because we also are related to both sides of the coin, right? Um, right? People who, regardless of what information you ever present to them, they are invested in the reality in which they've chosen to exist within. And you really need to figure out whether or not it's, it's safe, whether it's not productive, whether it's productive to even trying to engage those folks. Um, and I say this as someone who comes from a, a Black family, comes from a family that um, have seen the downfalls of our society, but there's still some folks who, um, particularly on my more um, <laughs> Caucasian side, who are very much um, believing what they see or are told by, by, by institutions like Fox News, versus there are people in your family who you know, maybe you don't want to have an entire family discussion with, but maybe a one-off conversation, or maybe you just want to subtly share um, a resource like an article or a video and like build that up over time. You also can't assume that one conversation with them is going to change their entire mindset. Um, but I say that they're very, um, we should be a little bit more cautious in how we engage those folks versus random people in the community only because these are people we share blood with, right? We care about these folks, we love them and we want them to be successful. But I will say over the last few weeks, we've seen a lot of young people call out their parents in very public ways. So you also have to question whether or not a belief that your family member has actively puts you in danger or actively goes against what you believe in and make a conscious decision before you have a conversation what are you willing to deal with versus what are you not willing to deal with, right? I'm not willing to deal, to engage with someone who doesn't believe that, I, that police shouldn't stop, shouldn't stop killing people who look like me. I'm not willing to engage with people who don't believe that misogyny exists and that women are constantly being judged by what they're wearing versus what a predator did to them. And so make a decision before you decide to engage anyone in your family, what you will and won't deal with. And then again, identify them as the two categories of people who are not willing to even have a conversation with you, they're gonna believe what they wanna believe versus the people who don't have the information and need someone to help guide them through that process or at the very least receive additional resources to get them there. Yeah, that's a good point. And, and one kind of extreme example, Jameer, and I, you probably have heard about this, one young lady turned in her mother, her uncle, 
and her father <laughs> um, because she was, I guess, ostracized from her own family for being a lesbian. And then mm -hmm. they told her not to go to Black Lives Matter protests, whatever. Then she saw them on the TV, you know, doing you things. Right. One of them had a busted lip. I think it was the mama. But anyway, yeah. uh, she turned to men. Now, we're not suggesting that you do that to your family, but that's just an extreme example. You have to figure out, like Jamira said, is something that somebody holds as a belief going to directly harm me as a person or my personhood. So I just threw that out there. Uh, here's another good one. Thank you for being here with this important information. I am fully inspired. Can you please share a moment when somebody used their privilege to elevate your voice? And also when you elevated somebody else's voice with your privilege? That's a great question. Um, I am extremely lucky because at every major milestone, I always had some mentor or someone who saw potential in me. Um, so I guess what a most recent incident is um, during the DNC, um, the Democratic National Convention, um, conversations that I was not a privy to, I wasn't a part of, um, they were in the process of designing one of the talks to then candidate Joe Biden. And they said that they wanted to have a conversation around what does violence look like around America? Who are the different um, types of people who are trying to solve violence in communities? And they knew they wanted a young person and um, a young lady who I previously engaged with when we were both on opposite sides of, in 2016, she worked for um, Bernie Sanders. I worked for Hillary Clinton. Um, Simone Sanders is, is, that, is that person. She recommended me because she knew that not only was I just someone out speaking about why young people should be a part of the conversation in regards to violence prevention, but also I, I was someone who had actually worked for the last 10 years in different institutions on that very same issue. So I could add much more context to just an opinion. And so that was an opportunity where, again, th there's probably hundreds of people she could have recommended, but she thought that as a Black woman, as someone who was directly impacted, but also someone who worked in the space could be a good voice for that, that work. And how I try to elevate young people um, particularly is, you know, to this day, I still get asked to be a youth speaker. And instead of me taking those opportunities, which pays really well, um, I always recommend another young person because I think it's really important for us as folks who have come from impacted communities to not allow our individual experience to be too tokenized, right? To be seen as the only version of events. And so I'm a constant believer of like, how do we continue to add different versions of events so people can understand that these issues impact different communities very differently, um, even if they are um, harnessed by the same institution. And so I'm constantly thinking about who can I bring along as a person plus one, what opportunities can I pass on to someone younger or with a different experience? Um, because you know what's yours is yours and you don't have to see this space as a competition, but as a collective effort for all of us to get, again, to the promised land. That's awesome, an opportunity. I'm gonna remember that in my own personal life, to add, opportunity to add a plus one. Mm -hmm. um, this is a really cute, good question. Um, how do you get young ones involved? My daughter is almost 10 and is always asking what she can do to help. Oh, I know, um, right? <laughs> I love the young people. I'm just like, oh, I can retire now. They're ready to leave. They have parents, <laughs> say no more. Um, I would, uh, two things that I would say is one, I would be curious in conversation with her. Like, what is she interested in, right? What, why do she want to get engaged? Um, um, how does she want to specifically harness her own statute, right? So if she's in, I think 10 years old is what, middle school? So old. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Middle school? Yeah, thinking about like what programs already exist within her 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 space. So in her school, in her local community that she can sign up with. Um, there are a number of national organizations that have local chapters that do leadership development programs. Um, everything from the NAACP to Student Voice, which is an organization run by students for students for education. So there are thousands of youth organizations that welcomes new young people to be able to be a part of that process to get more educated in the issue. Um, so I would first say, definitely have a larger conversation with her about what she could be potentially interested in and then narrow down who to potentially expose her to based on the topics, the subject area, or looking at those other holistic organizations like Young People For who are training youth leaders um, to kind of set her on a pathway to success. But I'm excited to hear that even at 10, she is thinking about like how she can get engaged because 
young people can, I think if we continue to harness them and celebrate them and empower them, um, we don't have, they don't have to wait for permission to do the right thing. And hopefully that will make all of our lives much more simpler. Absolutely. Say, Not um, I forgot who said it. It's easy to build strong adults than to rebuild, to repair broken men and women. Mm -hmm. And so it starts early. Yeah, I was going to add one of the people that uh, I've been inspired by that was a, is a sort of, he's a young person still, but um, his name is David Hogg. And I don't know if yeah, you yeah. him. he was part of the Parkland. I think that mm -hmm. was his high school in Florida. They got shot up. And ever yeah. since then, and even during that time, he's been very vocal, very mm -hmm. uh, outspoken and about gun violence and things like that. I have followed him and supported, you know, things that he's doing, but it was just inspiring to see this 16, 17 year old kid who survived this thing and was like no more. So mm -hmm. um, I would just add to to find people like that and you know encourage them to follow them on social media or just see what they're doing. There's a ton of stuff. Um, exactly, our young people are already on social media. So like the question is how do we ensure that they're consuming information from folks who are on the path that they themselves want to be on like yes, David. Absolutely. Um, this is a good question to kind of end, uh, we come to the end of the hour, but I thought it was very pertinent. In spite of the inauguration and general nervousness for the election, what words of advice or encouragement can you give to BIPOC who are scared about possible backlash? I'm sorry, say that last part again. Uh, what words of advice can you give to uh, BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, persons of oh. color who are scared for possible backlash? regarding everything surrounding the inauguration? <laughs> I know it's a big question, isn't it? It's a big question because I have friends who work in the advocacy space who are debating on whether or not they themselves show up as a counter protest to what mm -hmm. we know are gonna be happening around the country. Um, to be honest, I would say at the very baseline is to stay safe, um, especially over the next few days. It's like really be conscious of are you actively going into spaces and places that may put you at danger, in danger? Um, who you're engaging with, right? Who are your friends um, that you have cultivated relationships with? Um, are, you in, are you traveling in pairs? Are you traveling in groups to minimize the opportunity for folks to potentially use violence against you? Um, and then also, to be honest, we're all going to be facing, um, there, there are millions of people who are in opposition to us. We saw that with the election, right? I had no idea 70 million people would still vote to keep a racist, sexist, xenophobic person in office. But it's a reminder that whiteness is a disease, right? That doesn't just impact whiteness. It also impacts our systems and our policies. And so I would definitely say, you know, look for places to be supported um, and not necessarily put yourself in danger. And then also, to be honest, every single, moment in history when we've ever had any real progression or success, there's always been a white backlash. There's right. always a white backlash. And so this is not new to our generation. The question is, how are we still staying motivated and positive to keep the work going despite folks who will hate us and not allow us to get access to resources and opportunities? Right. So basically, let, them, let those folks kick rocks with no shoes on um, and go about your day being great and amazing. That's awesome. Uh, real, uh, uh, last one that's kind of good too for those of us or those folks who have not ever been active. She asks, um, everything you have said has really empowered me to make a change in my community. Uh, what suggestions do you have for a woman who wants to make a difference in her area when she has never really gotten into activism before? Learn. Yeah. Um, it's learn, learning. Um, and I say that as someone who because the last thing you wanna do is, is enter a conversation or start doing work when you don't fully have a clear understanding of the issues you wanna care about. And so how are, how are you um, educating yourself on the topics in which you want to be engaged in? And then figuring out who are those support systems, those organizations, those individuals who are leading that charge is one way. It's definitely learn as much as you can, but also recognize that learning is a lifelong journey. So you're never right. gonna know every single thing you need to know. The second thing I would do is like, how are you joining organizations or donating to organizations that are elevating and are supporting the, the, the version of the world in which you wanna create? Mm -hmm. um, and then also, how are you holding your friends, your family members accountable to that ideology? Um, those are three things that I would definitely say to do is learn, connect with or already existing organizations, and then do your friends and family represent 
um, the ideology in which you want to continue to perpetuate around the world? Or is that the first place you need to educate and rebrand first? Right. I'm going to ask you this one last quick question because it's so good in light of this being MLK Day and a lot of people always using uh, his his uh, quotes of nonviolence. <laughs> so wait till you hear this question though. Um, how do you feel about violence being used as a way to being heard? Because sometimes it feels like nonviolence doesn't get the full point across. This is so hard. Um, and I say this as someone who, you know, <laughs> It's so funny when you watch news from even three, six months ago or even a year ago, the way they were described black protesters who were not committing violence act or when it was, it was oftentimes like at a Target. Y'all, Target has a billion dollar insurance policy. They good. Um, versus how terrorist groups of recent days, um, you know, a part of me does not believe in violence as a solution. Um, but, you know, as someone who graduated from the school of Malcolm X ideology, I'm also convinced that, um, at some point, I hope it does not come to be, we are going to have to respond in violence in order to protect our own bodies. So we may not start the fight, but we definitely might, as my mother would say, should end it. Um, my, and so I don't, <laughs> right? my mother used to say, you better not have started, started the fight, but you, you better not have ended it. <laughs> yeah, you better have ended it. So I, I definitely don't promote violence as a form of a solution, but we should be ready to respond when violence comes to our doorstep because it has come, it's going to continue to come as long as there exist people who don't believe that we, we should exist. Um, and so we see folks, right, with their, we, we've seen videos of folks teaching their children how to shoot guns and like how to serve their survival gear and how to survive in the wilderness. We're not doing that to our young people, specifically in communities of color. And so right. I would say we should, that's one thing we should <laughs> reevaluate right. is, are we thinking about our forms of safety? Um, prime example, I don't believe in guns, but as long as the opposition has guns, our community should also have them to protect ourselves. Right. So um, it's a very weird, it's, it's definitely in conflict with the way in which I wanna view the world, but I recognize that you know, real progress is complicated and our safety is going to ever be, or especially um, our safety as people of color is always gonna be a jeopardy. Um, because our lives are politicized every single day. So be yeah. prepared, find ways to protect yourself and your family, but not necessarily see violence as the solution for how you should handle every problem. Problem, absolutely, absolutely. And armed protesters is not a protest. I'll just say that. <laughs> that part. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just want to thank you so much. You have been so inspiring. The comments are just, you know, this is awesome. I'm going to hand off more opportunities in the future. So you've really resonated um, with us today. And I was very pleased to see your name on um, some of the stuff that we could have as a speaker. So you have been more than awesome. Mm -hmm. I will add before we leave that on Wednesday and I'll send out more information, we do have a tough talk about Dr. King's legacy um, and what he would think today. So we'll be sending that information out um, on the day of inauguration so we can have a conversation about just what would he say if he was here right now and seeing the things that are going on? One thing, Jamira, that I noticed about one night in Miami, it was almost like, well, this is going on now. <laughs> and that was like, what, 30 years ago or something like that? History Boy, repeats itself with you know, new characters. Absolutely. <laughs> so I just want to, on behalf of Missouri State University Multicultural Programs, just give you a warm thank you. This was great, exceeded all expectations. Um, keep up the good work. If there's anything we can ever do to advocate or assist you, please don't hesitate to contact me and we will get something going on, you know, the Missouri Springfield level, if we can for you. And I just have really enjoyed you. I thank you for taking the time out today because it's your MLK Day too, <laughs> uh, to speak with us and share your journey. And it's just been remarkable. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I hope everyone continues to stay safe and stay and start and continue to be, think positive about the future, regardless of oftentimes how it can feel insurmountable. But I, I had an, an amazing time and I hope we continue to stay connected. Yes, absolutely. And like she said, continue to do things and engage in things. Never lose hope. I'm a person mm -hmm. just like you. Never lose hope. No matter how dark it seems, there's always hope on the other side. Exactly. So everyone enjoy the rest of your day. Um, Jamira, you too. Thank you so much. And we will be in touch. Awesome. Thank you so much. Have a great one.